Okay, why don't we get started? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Virtual Distinguished Lecturer Program webinar of the IEEE Circuits and Systems Society. My name is Chris Chakrabarty, and I'm the chair of the Distinguished Lecturer Program. Due to the COVID pandemic, our distinguished lecturers are not able to travel to give talks at the CAS Society chapters. Therefore, we have initiated uh, a virtual distinguished lecture series. Uh, we had uh, series one on machine learning AI. Uh, we had series two on biomedical applications. And now we are doing series three on analog and RF systems. So let me introduce the distinguished speaker for today. Our speaker is Professor Nan Sun. Professor Sun uh, is an associate professor and holder of the Temple Foundation Endowed Chair at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he has a very distinguished uh, biography, but let me keep it short this morning. He received his PhD from Harvard University in 2010. And since then he has been at uh, UT Austin. He won the NSF Career Award in 2013. And very recently in 2020, he won the uh, IEEE Solid State Circuit Society a, a, a New Frontier Award. Uh, before I hand over to Professor Sun, a couple of um, remarks. Uh, this seminar is being recorded, so you'll be able to uh, have a link to the video later. And you can ask questions at the end of the presentation, but in the meantime, you can type them in, you can send them through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the talk, uh, we'll, we'll have our Q&A. With that, let me uh, hand over to Professor Sun. Yeah, Chris, thank you very much for your uh, introdu nice introduction. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming to my talk. Uh, I guess I'm going, uh, you can see my face now. So but I'm, uh, just to make sure that we have enough bandwidth for, uh, for the talk, uh, I'm going to close my uh, video uh, and then I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, is it working correctly? Can you hear my voice? Yes, it's fine. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so let me get started. So today I'm gonna to talk about uh, how to break uh, the Katie Young C noise limit. Uh, this is like a work that we have uh, been working on in the past like three, four years uh, and been uh, published at uh, IS 2019 and 2020, uh, two works. Uh, so uh, let me uh, get started and talk about some review of Katie over C noise. So, uh, well, uh, this is a very basic kind of circuit for the sample and hole circuit. Uh, so we know, we know that if you have a sample and hole circuit, uh, when you open the switch, uh, there's going to be noise uh, sampled uh, on the capacitor. And this noise and uh, the noise power is given by KT over C. And this is kind of what we learned from like an undergrad class. Uh, and this noise, it's, uh, well, it's, it's uh, directly related to the capacitor size. So for example, if you want your uh, signal to noise ratio uh, to reach about 80 dB, uh, then you need a capacitor size of three picofarad. And if you want higher SNR, that basically means that you want your noise to be smaller. Uh, for example, if you want to increase your SNR by 6 dB, uh, you have to uh, quadruple the size of your capacitor. Uh, and this is, becomes very, uh, very difficult because you can think about if you want to go beyond 90 dB, the capacitor actually has to be in the range of 40 or 50 picofarad. And this is quite large capacitor. Uh, we know that, for example, if you take a look at a SAR ADC, uh, a SAR uh, analog to digital converter, uh, and it's shown here, it's a very basic block. And we know that there's a front end sample and hole circuit. And the sample and hole circuit, the core of the sample and hole circuit is basically a capacitor, right? And this capacitor will introduce this uh, sample and hole, uh, like KD over C noise. And to make sure that uh, you can design a high resolution converter, you need a capacitor to be very big. Uh, and that, this makes it very hard to design the ADC driver, the input driver, as well as the reference buffers. And it turns out that these two circuit blocks, okay, the ADC input driver and the reference buffers, these actually are the bottlenecks of nowadays. They can actually consume even more power than the ADC core itself. Uh, and, and, and it's harder to design and they consume a lot of area and power and it's, uh, the design complexity is quite high and so on and so forth. So it's very desirable if you can come up with techniques that actually can reduce the KD over C noise and allow us to use smaller capacitors. If you can use smaller capacitors, then the input driver will be very easy to design. It will be low power, low area, low cost, uh, as well as the reference buffers. So this is really a nice thing if we can figure out a way to reduce capacitor size 
but without incurring a large penalty on the KD over C noise. Okay, so this is rather kind of a sim, uh, kind of a very easy definition of the problem, but this kind of like uh, uh, so far people have taken it for granted that the KD over C noise is kind of unbeatable and it, it's there and it's it, it's limiting the performance or limiting the SNR, right? So that's the motivation of our work. We want to figure out ways that actually can reduce uh, the KD over C noise uh, and allow us to use a small capacitor size. Okay, so this is kind of the review of uh, or the motivation of our work. So let me kind of show you some of the results uh, of our work uh, and we publish at these uh, conferences. Okay, so let me get started with the first work. It's a salmon hole less continuous time star ADC. Okay, so let's take a look at a, a pipeline uh, analog to digital converter. And this is like the classic, uh, 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 classic schematic. Uh, so we have a first stage uh, and then followed by interstage gain amplifier uh, and then followed by a second stage ADC. Uh, in the first stage, we know that there's a SAMP and hole circuit, just like a SAR. And you will always have a SAMP and hole circuit by Nyquist rate converter. And this SAMP and hole circuit is not a surprise. It's a switch and a capacitor. Uh, and then this capacitor, uh, it's shown here, is basically your uh, sampling capacitor. And this you know, sample uh, brings a KD over C noise. Uh, if, and we mentioned, Right, the KD over C noise is very bad, uh, and you need a very large capacitor to make sure it's small. So we can think about like how we can actually solve this problem. Well, one very direct way is to just remove this sample hole circuit. Right, if you can remove the sample hole circuit, apparently we won't introduce the KD over C noise. Uh, so this is pretty nice. There's no KD over C noise. If you get rid of the sample hole, you operate the front end completely in continuous time. So this looks really nice. But um, you kind of like want to ask the question, right? This is so simple and does not have KD over C noise. Uh, if you just simply remove the, K, uh, the sample and hole circuit, um, but why people don't do it, right? Uh, there must be a reason. Uh, there must be some benefit uh, when you use the sample and hole circuit. Well, yes, there is very nice uh, benefit uh, for using the sample and hole circuit. What, what are the benefits? Well, one very important benefit is that when you sample the input, uh, the input becomes static, right? It doesn't move anymore. It's being held on a capacitor, right? It, it doesn't change anymore. And this is very important because in the converter, uh, when you sample the input, we're gonna do some operations on the sample voltage, right? Uh, so what we do is shown in this slide, what we do is that we first have an ADC that will convert uh, this sampled uh, analog input to a digital output. And then we'll use a DAC to convert it back to an analog voltage and subtract that from the original input, right? And then the residue uh, is the output of the analog subtractor and is sent to the interstage gain amplifier and again amplified and then move to the second stage, right? So this is how pipeline ADC works. If you have a sample and hold, then, then, then this works properly. Uh, so for example, like let's say shown on the, on the right bottom uh, figure. So the input, let's say is rising, okay? This uh, light green is the input, continuous time input and it's rising, okay? Uh, but then, when you, when you have a sample and hold volt, uh, circuit, it will be sampled uh, at, let's say, uh, this time instance. So let me try to use my uh, uh, laser pointer. So let's say the input is being sampled at this point. Then it, it doesn't change anymore. So let's say that you, you want to do the data conversion uh, for the ADC. And then um, it will be, let's say, the ADC finish its job and give you the output at this time uh, instance. And then this is sent to the DAC to convert back to an analog voltage and then subtract from the sample input. And you can see that uh, this converted uh, like output from the DAC is very close to the analog input. Uh, and therefore the conversion residue is very small and, and it can be amplified by the interstage gain amplifier. Uh, so this works very well when you have a sample and hole circuit and then ADC and DAC process the same sample input, right? So there's basically no delay mismatch between these two channels uh, and it works very well, right? This is kind of how pipeline ADC works. When you get rid of the sample and hold, right? Let's say that how, if we get rid of the sample and hold, if there's no sample and hold, then things get changed. The input is actually continuous time and it's varying with time, right? So let's say, let's take a look at this, um, this time domain uh, uh, graph uh, again. Let's say the input is rising, okay? So again, at this time moment, we, uh, we trigger the ADC and starts to work. And let's say we convert uh, the uh, input uh, sample at, at this point, a sample like to a, to a digital output. And you convert it back to a digital, uh, uh, back to an analog voltage by a DAC, right? And then at this moment, you want to do the subtraction. So now you don't have the sample and hold. 
So the difference is very big, right? As the input changes with time, the difference is very big. And now if we amplify it through an amplifier, it will easily saturate the amplifier in the second stage ADC, right? So this is a fundamental kind of, not really fundamental, but this is a very big problem, right? When you see that the input that you, 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 when you trigger the ADC and the DAG is actually at this moment, when you want to do the subtraction is actually at this moment. Uh, so there is a big difference in the signal, right? And this actually uh, caused the saturation problem. So this is the reason that why we use a sample and hold, right? Even though that this will bring the KD over C noise, right? So that's the, the reason that we use sample and hold circuit. Okay, uh, so let's think about it, right? This is real the problem. Uh, so what is the fundamental reason? Well, the fundamental reason is that uh, you have the same input and the continuous time input and it's traveling along two paths, right? This is the upper, upper path and there's a lower path. And the lower path, we perform the data conversion ADC and the DAC operation, and then subtract from this upper path. In the upper path, there's no delay, right? There's no signal processing. So it just passed through without much delay. But then in this lower path, we have these operations and it takes time to finish. And then there's a delay mismatch. So when the signal tra uh, travels through these two different paths and we will subtract, if it's, it's a continuous time signal, it, it won't really, subtract very well, right? It won't be the same signal and it won't subtract well. If you have sample and hold, it's fine because the signal becomes like a DC signal. And then if you have a delay mismatch, that doesn't really matter. But if you have continuous time input and there's delay mismatch, when you subtract, it's going to be a large conversion residue and will saturate later stages, right? So this is really the, the fundamental problem. Why like, uh, uh, like people, you, I mean, if you get rid of the sample and hold. Okay, so how can we solve this problem? Well, there are a few ways. One way is that you can actually add a negative delay uh, in this lower path and try to cancel this uh, positive delay. This may appear uh, kind of like uh, non-causal uh, or unrealistic because how can we actually create a negative delay, right? It's kind of predicting the future, right? Rather than delaying. So how can you predict the future? Well, it's, it's not easy uh, to really kind of create a, a, a block that give you a negative delay, but you can actually realize this within the signal band, okay? Let's say the signal is band limited from, uh, from let's say zero to a certain bandwidth. Uh, and you can, you can create a filter that have a negative delay within that band, okay? Not over the entire bandwidth, but within a certain band, it's doable. So how, how can we create a negative delay over a certain band? Well, you can use this kind of like a prediction type of filter or a high pass filter. And this is like an OTA based design and this can create the negative delay within the signal band. Okay, so this can really make it work, but you can see that uh, this circuit has a lot of OTAs and this OTA needs to be wide band and they consume quite a large amount of power. So this is not desirable from that sense. Okay, so it's just not very efficient from a, a power perspective. Is there other solution? Uh, well, another solution is that you actually add, add a positive delay in the upper path and try to match these two delays, right? If they're matched, then it's also okay when the signal reach each other and they will basically meet each other and they, the, the conversion residue will be very small. And it is also illustrated uh, in the bottom right figure. Uh, but how can we create a positive delay, a constant positive delay uh, for an analog input? Well, this can be done by using lattice filters. Uh, for example, shown here, uh, this is like an inductor and capacitor. Okay, you form a lattice filter and this is going to uh, basically uh, create a delay uh, for a given uh, bandwidth signal. Okay, so this can actually work also very well, um, but it also has its own limitations. Well, when you see capacitors and inductors, you can see, you notice that, well, these values will vary with process uh, variation, right? So we always need tuning to make sure that the delay is basically what you want, right? If the inductance and capacitance value change a lot, uh, then they may not match each other, right? So you need tuning, so this is one thing. Another thing is that well, when you see inductors, we know that implementing inductors on chip is actually quite costly. It has a lot of, like, occupied a lot of area. And if you need multiple of them, it would be quite area consuming. So that's the challenge. Another thing is that when you see inductors, uh, if you implement them on chip, then this inductor won't be uh, like ideal, right? It will have resistance, it will produce noise. But that's yet another limitation uh, for using on chip inductors. Overall, this can actually work for a wideband kind of like a, a circuit uh, despite its limitations. But another thing is that you want to use this kind of method for low uh, to medium speed applications. You may need this tunnel to be quite big 
And this means that you need a very large capacitance and inductance values, and that will further exa like, uh, exacerbate kind of the challenge on, in terms of chip area and so on. So this is not so desirable. Okay, so we want to basically figure out an, a method, not like the previous two solutions. We want to figure out a way that it actually can address this issue, uh, make sure that we can actually operate the front end in continuous time, but with low cost, okay, low area, low power, uh, and, and the minimum kind of circuit cost. Okay, so let's re-examine this problem, right? The root cause. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the root cause of the problem uh, is this delay, right? The delay mismatch, uh, this tau basically. This tau basically caused uh, the uh, converted uh, kind of analog output, uh, the, the output of the DAC, and then the, the, the input at this moment uh, make sure it made them not to match each other, right? Because this converted DAC output corresponds to the input sample at this moment. Right, and this time difference caused a big, uh, big uh, difference uh, in, in, in the signals. Okay, so, well, can we address this? Well, one idea is that if you can minimize, simply minimize tau, then this error will reduce, right? So how can we minimize tau? Let's, take, let's think about it. What, is the, what causes a large tau, a large delay? Well, uh, if you have a multi-bit ADC and multi-bit DAC, that actually can take a longer time and have a, a larger delay. And also you have analog subtraction and that will also uh, like uh, have some delay, right? So these are kind of the reasons, right? From a circuit perspective. So these circuits have delays and then they uh, produce this delay tau. So uh, if we can actually think about other solutions uh, then maybe we can reduce this tau. So here are a few ways. One way is that, well, uh, this is multi bit ADC and DAC, so it, it takes longer time and also have analog subtraction. Maybe I can replace it by a single bit operation, a single bit ADC and single bit DAC. And let's say if I can have inherent subtraction, uh, that would be better, right? That would have a shorter delay. Um, and, and that's indeed true, right? If you have a single bit operation, for example, like just do a single bit converter, uh, like a, a single comparator, and then you have an inherent subtraction like a SAR ADC in the capacitor kind of like subtraction, uh, this actually will have a smaller delay. But you may wonder that, well, for a pipeline converter, usually for power efficiency perspective, we don't, we don't want just to have a one bit in the first state. We want multiple bits, right? How can you have multiple bits? Well, we can just repeat the single bit conversion cycle multiple times, right? For example, you want n bit, you can just perform this conversion cycle n times, like the, the success approximation kind of operation. You can perform it n times, and then this way you can get n bits, right? But then you, you may wonder, wait a minute, right? If you use n cycles, okay, you repeat it n times, wouldn't the delay being amplified by also n times, right? Even though each cycle, it was only a single bit conversion and, and a single bit DAC and, and an inherent analog subtraction. But if you have N cycles, you have to multiply the delay uh, of all the blocks by N times. This may be even bigger than the delay for a multi-bit AZ and multi-bit DAC and analog subtractor, right? Uh, so here, there's one very important thing uh, uh, to understand. Even though we actually have N cycles, this delay actually does not accumulate. Why? Well, the key reason is that input is actually time varying, right? There's no sample and hold, and this input is actually varying. So you can think about it. When the, during the first cycle, we're operating in an, in an, on, an, on an analog input. During the second cycle, the input gets changed. So we're actually operating on a new input. So every time, we're actually operating on a fresh new input. So this delay does not accumulate. So every time, you're operating on its present uh, input. And this is actually one of the key reasons that the delay it doesn't accumulate. Okay, so once you realize it doesn't accumulate, then you can, you can see, okay, the net delay is very short uh, because even though we have N cycles, it's equivalent to only a single cycle delay. Okay, it, this is very nice. But you may ask this question. Okay, so yes, there's no delay accumulation, which is very great, uh, but um, every time you're operating in a new input, if the input varies, maybe the conversion result, the prior or the previous uh, conversion result, maybe they were wrong, right? Uh, well, it can happen, right? Here is one example. Let's say the input is actually rising and then this is like uh, the conversion like uh, threshold. So let's say at this tight moment, the input actually below the threshold voltage. So this way we say that, okay, my conversion is that the input is actually below this threshold. Let's say it's below zero. Then uh, what I should do is that I should search 
uh, at a lower space, right? Search when the input is lower. But let's say the input is actually rising, it's varying with time. So after a certain time, the input is already becoming bigger than zero, right? So this means that the previous conversion result was actually wrong, right? Because I'm actually now looking at the input at this moment, but this conversion result in the previous clock cycle, uh, it's actually seeing a, an input below zero. The conversion is actually wrong, right? This is something we have to address, but we know how to address it, right? We can embed redundancy, right? Which is a classic approach in the SAR ADC design to kind of tolerate attack incomplete settling errors, like sometimes like a comparator noise and so on, right? So we can put redundancy and this redundancy, as long as able to recover uh, the very the error caused by input variation, then uh, the conversion result can still track the input and give us the correct conversion result at the end, right? So basically, uh, what we do is that we combine redundancy and uh, this uh, uh, continuous uh, one bit kind of conversion uh, cycles, and we put them together, and we can minimize tau. And we're also going to use like dynamic circuit to minimize uh, the, the circuit delays. So by putting them all together, we can have a solution that is low cost and low complexity. Okay, so now let me show you kind of the uh, the uh, schematic of uh, our uh, pi uh, our like two stage converter. Okay, so you first you can take a look at uh, the uh, front end. So this front end is the input is actually AC coupled. Uh, so you can see that there's no sample and hole circuit, there's no switch, and therefore there's no KD over C noise. Uh, and then uh, this capacitance size can be very small. This unit capacitance is only one femtofarad. You can see that input capacitance, uh, characterized, let's say represented by the 60C, is only 60 femtofarad. It is 50 times smaller than that for a, a, a classic kind of like discrete time Nyquist rate converter. Uh, that we will usually need like three to four picofarad, right? Here is 50 femtofarad. So it's like a 50 times reduction uh, of the input capacitance size. And if you can reduce that, you can significantly relax the reference buffer uh, requirement and also the input driver uh, requirement. So basically you can use smaller DAC, smaller switches and continuous time operation. So you can have relaxed uh, design for these circuits. And that's the goal, right? The motivation of our work. Uh, the way it works is that the following. So first we'll have the reset phase and in the reset phase, all of these capacitors, they're, uh, the, the bottom plate are connected to the common mode voltage, uh, complete resetting these capacitors. And then in, in the in the first uh, in the continuous time uh, conversion uh, conversion phase is basically the front uh, the, the first stage. Then the input it's AC coupled, and then we perform the conversion uh, for the input in a continuous time manner. And then once uh, and during this conversion, we're actually operating uh, the DAC logic uh, the, the SAR logic uh, using the high speed uh, dynamic SAR logic to speed up the the, uh, the operation. And once that is done, we use the dynamic amplifier to amplify the conversion residue. Okay, and then uh, it will be sampled uh, by the second stage. So you'll notice that there indeed, there is a sample and hold circuit in the second stage, and this will introduce KD over C noise. But uh, because this is likely in the second stage, the KD over C noise introduced by the second stage is going to be attenuated by the interstage gain amplifier. So if this amplifier, let's say, provide a gain of 30 or 20, uh, then you can imagine that the noise, KD over C noise coming from the second stage, will be significantly attenuated when input referred. Uh, as a result, the second stage capacitor, they can also be quite small, right? So both input and second stage uh, can have very small capacitor size. So after dynamic uh, uh, amplifier, uh, the interstage uh, amplifier operation, uh, it's the second stage. So in the second stage, it's just like a normal uh, pipeline uh, stage. We'll perform the discrete time conversion uh, and then get the second stage output. And the final ADC conversion result is the combination of the first stage and the second stage. So we put them together, just like a regular two-stage uh, converter, uh, and we get the final conversion result. Okay, uh, so here for the dynamic amplifier, just the one uh, one quick note that we use the dynamic amplifier uh, shown like here. Uh, it's a combination of floating dynamic amplifier and the positive feedback. Uh, so we use the floating dynamic amplifier to provide a stable common mode response and also higher power efficiency. Uh, and we have this uh, internal positive feedback circuit uh, just to make sure that we can have very high gain. We have very fast uh, amplification. Uh, but this is actually not the only way. You can also design your own dynamic amplifier. Uh, it, it won't change the whole uh, operating of the entire uh, uh, circuit. So the first stage, as long as you operate in continuous time, it is KD over C 
uh, uh, free. So you, you can use very small capacitors. Uh, here we use this dynamic amplifier just because we, we want like a stable common mode response and high power efficiency, high gain and fast regeneration. Okay, so now let me show you uh, the circuit, um, uh, the prototype circuit we built in order to verify the proposed architecture. So this is a chip that we built. Uh, it's in 40 nanometer uh, low power CMOS process. Uh, the die photo is like uh, expanded, like shown here. You can see that the circuit is actually quite small. The entire circuit is a 13 bit converter is only uh, 150 micro by 84 micrometer. And these capacitors, they're very small because they have been significant tenu, uh, uh, like, like uh, they can be significantly uh, decreased, right? Uh, in the, into the range of uh, femtofarad, like 100 femtofarad range. It's not like three or four picofarad, right? So that's make it, that's allow it to be very small. Uh, this is the uh, measured uh, spectrum. Uh, so this is the measured measure spectrum in low frequencies. So here we get SMDR of about 73.5 dB, SFDR about 87 uh, dB. And here is like near the Nyquist rate, we get 72 dB of SMDR and about 80 dB for SMDR. And here is the, the whole frequency sweep uh, from the low frequency up to the ni near Nyquist rate. We go up, almost get a flat uh, SMDR performance and also an uh, SFDR performance that is uh, uh, in the 80 or 90 dB kind of range. Uh, here, the sampling rate is two megasamples per second. So the Nyquist band is one, uh, one megahertz. Okay, so now let me kind of like summarize. Uh, so in our community, right, we built circuit and it's very important to kind of have a, sum, uh, a comparison table uh, to compare with uh, prior works. So here is our work uh, shown on the, uh, the, right, uh, the right column. Uh, and here you can see that we basically have a continuous time SAR uh, based first stage uh, in the two stage converter. Uh, and then we are able to significantly attenuate uh, the front end KD over C noise because we operate the first stage in continuous time. Uh, this is a 13 bit converter, uh, but its input capacitance is only 60 femtofarad, right? Comparing to uh, these work, more like classic kind of implementations with the seven hole circuit, they need very large capacitors. Uh, like 4 pico, 9 pico, or 15, uh, 16 pico farad uh, in order to uh, make sure the KD over C noise is small enough. But for our work, we can allow uh, the front end to have a very small capacitance of only 60 femtofarad. Overall chip area is also significantly smaller than this prior works. Okay, uh, From a power efficiency perspective, uh, so this work, uh, you can see that it's very uh, competitive uh, to this uh, classic works. And then compared to these two works, uh, the prior two continuous time pipeline converters that I reviewed uh, in this talk, you can see that it's significantly better from a power efficiency perspective. And the overall, like, uh, uh, like Warden Figaro Mary and Schreier Figaro Mary, they're both quite competitive. And then I want to emphasize that this is only capturing the power of the ADC core. Uh, if you think about the ADC driver and the reference buffers, as I mentioned earlier, they can be actually even more power hungry than the ADC core itself. So for our work, because we can significantly reduce the input capacitance size, we can relax the requirement on the input driver and the reference buffers. So there are gonna be even more savings in power on the, on the system level, on the higher level, on the architecture level. Okay. So there's a lot of benefits uh, for this, uh, for the proposed work in, by reducing the input capacitance. Okay, so that's the first uh, work that I present uh, the, or one solution to attack this uh, KD over C noise. Uh, and then in this year's ISSCC, we have another solution. Uh, it's based on cancellation. So it's a different uh, idea, but I, I think it's also very interesting. And I'd like to share it with you. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, so this is our prior work published in 2019. It has its benefit, as we mentioned earlier, it has no KD over C noise and a very small input capacity of 60 femtofarad but it also has its own limitations. So what are the limitations? Well, one limitation is that because the input is AC coupled, it is not directly applicable uh, to the DC signal. Uh, so it's kind of like works uh, if your signal is in a certain band, right? Like, uh, like uh, from a, let's say a hundred Hertz to like a megahertz type of thing. Uh, but it also have a limited input frequency, right? Because we want uh, the operation to be still, uh, the first stage to be significantly, to be very fast and much faster than the input variation. So this kind of a put a limit on the input frequency. It cannot be too quick. Uh, so here it limited to about one megahertz. So we want to have a, a different approach that actually can work for DC signal and can expand uh, the input frequency range. Okay, so that's the goal of our uh, kind of new work. So let's take a look. 
So this is our, uh, okay. Before we talk about our new work, let's first review a classic high resolution SAR ADC, okay? So in the high resolution SAR ADC, we usually use a uh, bottom plate sampling. So this is bottom plate sampling. Uh, this is our sampling whole circuit, right? And this is already used as the SAR deck. And then in the comparator, to make sure that we have low noise, we usually have a preamplifier uh, and then followed by a latch. Okay, the preamplifier has the gain usually like uh, three to 10. And this preamplifier allow us to reduce the noise from the latch as well as its offset, okay? Uh, and then we have the SAR logic and the SAR logic basically controls uh, how this uh, capacitor are connected in the conversion phase, okay? Uh, so this is a classic high resolution SAR ADC design. Uh, and then in this circuit, uh, we know that uh, how it works, right? There are two basically sampling phases, phi one, phi two, and there's like clock uh, for the comparators. Uh, and then when the phi one is on, so this is the sampling phase, we know that input is basically being tracked on this capacitor C1. And then there's going to be noise, uh, this kind of the uh, switch noise, uh, VNS1. And then at the moment, when we finish the sampling, we we'll basically turn, uh, turn off this switch, uh, the sampling finishes. And then at this time, we introduce the KD over C1 noise, uh, noise and is represented by this VNS1 here. And this noise, uh, it's very bad, right? It's introduced right in the, in the, in the front end, uh, in the uh, Simon Hope phase. So it limits the overall converters SNR, right? But there is one, uh, there is one uh, uh, kind of like uh, 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 understanding about this noise uh, because this noise after being sampled, it is frozen, right? It's like, a, it's shown uh, in, the, in the form of a noise charge represented uh, stored in the capacitor C1, right? It's once it's sample, this KD over C noise is frozen. It's like a DC signal and it's actually like an offset, okay? So if this is like an offset, this operate also represent an opportunity. Uh, maybe we can come up with a circuit technique to actually get rid of this, maybe cancel it out, right? If we can cancel out this DC signal like kind of like offset like noise, then we can recover the SNR, right? So that's the idea. So how can we actually do it? Well, we can actually use offset cancellation technique, right? For example, we can use the output series offset cancellation technique. So what we do is this, we add a capacitor at the output of the preamplifier and then add a switch uh, at, uh, at here. Uh, and then what we do is that um, when we turn off this phi one, this phi two switch is still on and this path, the signal path is still on. And this uh, sampled KD over C noise, KD over C1 noise will be amplified and stored across C2. And then if it is being amplified and stored across C2, they can imagine that in the next kind of conversion phase, uh, this noise can be canceled out because it's stored in, the, in, in C2 and it can be can canceled out in the next phase, just like a classic offset cancellation scheme, right? So this is kind of like the basic idea of our, uh, of our, our second approach. And if you can do that, then hopefully this KD over C1 noise can be canceled out. Uh, we will we'll have KD over C2 noise because we have another Sam and Hope circuit shown here. But this KD over C2 noise, it, it is after the preamplifier. And as a result, when you input refer it, this noise will be significantly attenuated, right? And if we shown here, it will be, will be, when you input refer, it will be VNS2 divided by A. So if A is large, let's say six, then this noise power from this KD over C2 noise will be attenuated by 60, 36 times and allow you to use also a small capacitor C2. So this is the basic idea, right? You can see from this equation, there's no KD over C1 noise. It's been canceled. So you can actually use a small capacitor C1. You don't need to worry about the KD over C1 noise. So that's the basic idea. But this may be still too abstract. Uh, so let me kind of walk you over step by step and show you how it works, okay? So here I, 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 I draw uh, the whole uh, signal kind of like uh, signal path, okay? Uh, and this is during the sampling phase. In the sampling phase, the input is being tracked uh, by the capacitor C1 and all of the switches are on. And here I also model the amplifier input referred offset shown here. Uh, and then I, I show you the, 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 the extra capacitor and switches, and then this is the latch, okay? 
So during the sampling phase, uh, the C1 is basically tracking the input. And then there will be going to be a, a, a noise, uh, the K over C1 noise, BNS1 shown here. And at this moment, uh, the uh, offset is also being amplified and stored on C2. Okay, And there's going to be K over C2 noise like shown here uh, as well, this BNS2 noise shown here. Okay, so this is the sampling phase. Uh, the input is being tracked uh, on C1, or we can call it a C1 sampling phase. And then in the next uh, time, uh, we're going to turn off uh, this switch, phi1, because at this moment, we turn off this uh, phi1 switch. So at this moment, we introduce the KD over C1 noise, shown as BNS1 here, and it's basically across this C1. So this noise, uh, it's frozen, as we mentioned, it's frozen across this capacitor C1. Uh, and then this noise, uh, it's being amplified and stored across C2, because this switch, phi2, and this switch, phi2, they're still on, the signal path is still on, it's still connected. And as a result, uh, this VNS1 will be amplified and uh, shown up here, okay? Uh, and then in this moment between T1 and T2, because the signal path is still on, the input is still being tracked, but this time it's being tracked uh, basically by, uh, by this amplifier and then by C2. So you can call it also the C2 sampling phase, okay? So this part, the in this, during this time, the, the signal path is still on, the input is still being tracked, the Knudsen input is being tracked, it's being amplified and tracked, okay? Um, and you can see that the signal being tracked is basically shown here, this Knudsen input is still being amplified and tracked across C2, okay? Uh, and then the real sampling moment actually is at the falling edge of T2. So the sampling operation only finishes at the end of T2. At this moment, you turn off this switch, you turn off this switch, and then the sampling operation finishes, okay? Um, and then at this moment, we also introduce KD over C2 noise, which is shown here, okay? So this, we finish all of the sampling phase. And then in the next conversion phase, equivalently, we are basically connecting the digital output at the left-hand side of the capacitor C1. And then through the successor approximation, uh, equivalently, we are actually forcing the latch input to be zero, right? So now we can write down this, the, the whole kind of signal relationship. So basically you have a D out, and then you have this sampled uh, input at T1 plus the noise, okay, the KD over C, C1 noise, and then add up the offset, and then signal get amplified, and then add the, the signal being sampled across C2, which is shown in this equation. And we know this has to be zero if you ignore, let's say, the quantization error, okay? Uh, and then from this, you can calculate the relationship between V in and, and D out. And this is the simple equation that I showed you earlier. You can see that the output is basically input plus uh, the KD over C2 noise, but attenuated by A times, okay? We don't see uh, the KD over C1 noise. Get, get, that get canceled out because of this offset kind of C, uh, output offset cancellation scheme, right? Because uh, even though we turn off by one, the noise is, is still here and being amplified and stored across C2, and that's why it got canceled. And then for this uh, K over C2 noise, it's there, but it's reduced significantly, right? By A square times, so it's also small. And this allow us to use both small capacitors for C1 and C2. Uh, and then I want to emphasize that the real sample signal is actually at T2, okay? It's actually not at T1. But then you may ask, so what is the point of doing a sampling at T1? Well, you do this sampling at T1 just to make sure that the signal here is very small, okay? The amplifier input is very small, so that even though that the input is actually varying between T1 and T2, uh, the small variation at this node won't saturate uh, this preamplifier, okay? So that's the, that's the point of this, uh, this C1 sampling, actually it's not uh, the real sampling moment, it's actually the T2 moment, the real sampling moment. Okay, so this is kind of how it worked. Uh, and then now let me kind of like uh, show you some of the practical considerations, right? So, so far we can use the very simple model uh, to basically explain that uh, the output should be like this, right? With the digital output uh, and then the input plus some KD over C2 noise divided by A, uh, and then this noise is KD divided by C2, right? This is using a very simple model. In a practical circuit, we have to think about other things, right? There's many other uh, circuit non-idealities. So let's take a look. So what are the non-idealities? Well, 
um, the amplifier actually has finite bandwidth. It's not instantaneous, right? Uh, and as a result, uh, it, it turns out it won't completely cancel this KD over C1 noise. So we have to take a look at uh, like, like this, uh, this incomplete cancellation effect. Uh, and also this preamplifier itself uh, generate noise. Okay, so we have to worry about this. Uh, there's also other non-idealities. For example, the preamp have actually non-linear input capacitance. The preamp also have delay itself. And the preamplifier also have gain mismatch uh, between the sampling phase and the conversion phase because they're converting, uh, they're actually processing different type of in, uh, signals. So I have to take a look at these uh, practical kind of considerations. So due to time limitation, I think I won't uh, uh, talk about it very detailed, but let me kind of like at least show you what are these considerations. Okay, so let's first take a look at input at the incomplete cancellation of the uh, uh, C1 sampling noise. So I'm showing you this, uh, this like uh, the block diagram once again, and this is during this, the, the critical kind of T1 or uh, T2 time. Uh, this is when we uh, do the, the C2 sampling. Uh, and then we do this like uh, uh, amplification of this noise, uh, VNS1, and we want it to be amplified by A time and stored across C2, right? During this time, this, uh, this time um, differences. If the amplifier is instantaneous, the bandwidth is infinite, then we know that the, this uh, sampled noise will definitely get amplified by A time and stored across C2. However, because this amplifier have a finite bandwidth, uh, this won't be, uh, this noise is actually kind of like a step signal uh, and it will have like a settling behavior, right? And it won't be instantaneous uh, and, and you can write it down as a very simple kind of first order equation. Uh, and from this, you know that uh, the real, the stored, the, the real stored uh, uh, amplified noise across C2 is not just A times uh, a VNS1, but rather it's like uh, uh, have this kind of relationship, right? It has this A and multiplied by a first order settling equation. So you can see that uh, this term, uh, if this term goes away, uh, then it's correct and it's the, uh, the noise get completely canceled. But for a finite bandwidth, uh, let's say, uh, and also like a, a finite kind of like a, a tracking time during the C2 sampling phase, delta T, then this, this term won't be zero, right? This tau basically reflects uh, the bandwidth of the amplifier. Uh, so, uh, so this you can you can calculate uh, that the residual sampling noise power uh, is given by this equation. So you can see that this is basically a canceling factor. Okay, so if you don't have any cancellation, just KD over C1, uh, and then you have this proposed uh, scheme, you have this cancellation factor. Uh, and then, well, uh, if you want very good cancellation, uh, there are two ways. One way you can actually increase the time difference, right? Make this delta T really large. Uh, basically have a large uh, settling time constants. Uh, I mean, a large number of time constant for the settling, right? But then you don't want this delta T to be too long because if the delta T is too long, uh, the input get is actually varying continuous time input. And then this actually can cause the output of the amplifier to saturate. Uh, so we have to worry about it. We don't want this delta to be too long. Another way to basically uh, have close to complete cancellation of the KD over C1 noise is to reduce the time constant or basically increasing the bandwidth of the amplifier. But this, we know that if you want to increase the bandwidth, that usually means that you have to increase the power, uh, need to increase the power. So basically there's trade-offs. So in this design to balance these two trade-offs, uh, we set delta T to be two times uh, the, the bandwidth of the amplifier. Uh, and then with, so basically it's not a complete settling. It only have two time constants, but this is enough. This means that we can actually reduce the KD over C noise by over 50 times. And this is enough for what we want. Okay, a 50 time reduction is, is already quite impressive. We also have to worry about the noise from the preamplifier. Uh, and this preemptifier uh, contribute noise during the sampling uh, in, the, in, the, in the C2 sampling phase, as well as in the comparison phase. So let's take a look at the noise uh, in the uh, C2 sampling phase first. So in this, uh, in this uh, 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 sampling phase, you can actually easily calculate that basically this preemptifier dominate the noise. Uh, and its noise uh, can be computed uh, uh, in, the, in this way. Uh, this is basically a classic noise analysis. So I, I don't think I need to spend time. Uh, the, basically, the, 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 what we know, I mean, it's very, very well known that if you want to reduce uh, the noise of the preamp, uh, then what you want to do is that you want to increase the gain of the preamp. 
but if it's too large, it can cause output saturation, as we mentioned earlier. And another way to kind of like reduce its noise is by increasing the load capacitor, but this will cause a slow settling. So again, we have these trade-offs. To kind of balance these two trade-offs, uh, what we do is that we use a relative low gain amplifier, not very high gain, a gain of six. So it's enough to suppress the gain over C2 noise. And it's still, still small enough uh, uh, just to allow us to have a wide bandwidth. And then we also add a additional capacitor CL, uh, to be two times of C2, is to limit the, the noise bandwidth uh, and to give us like a small kind of like uh, noise in the C2 sampling phase. And this C2 is also very helpful essentially in the uh, conversion phase because in the conversion phase, the C2 capacitor actually put in series between uh, the preamplifier and the latch. And therefore there's almost no loading uh, to the preamp uh, if you don't add this additional load capacitor. And this actually will make the, the amplifier to contribute a large amount of noise. So by having this load capacitor, it can actually attenuate noise coming from the preamp by a lot. And this is very helpful. Uh, and this analysis is also quite trivial, so I won't spend time. Uh, so this is kind of like how we uh, calculate it. Basically, by having this additional loading capacitor, we can actually limit the bandwidth and uh, filter out a large uh, portion of the uh, preamp noise. So this is kind of the overall noise summary. Uh, so we can compare uh, the conventional SAR ADC with the proposed uh, SAR ADC with KD over C noise cancellation. So shown on the left hand side, it's the, uh, the conventional SAR ADC noise uh, distribution. You can see that there's a large portion of the KD over C1 noise, the KD over C1 sampling noise is very large uh, and overall noise like 74.3 nanovolt per uh, square. For our proposed SAR ADC with, uh, with KD over C1 noise cancellation, you can see that uh, the dominant uh, C1 sampling phase in the conventional SAR ADC get canceled out and is only 4% of a smaller pi. Okay? Uh, and then in this new uh, architecture, we do introduce a, an additional noise. This is the additional KT over C2, right? Basically, uh, the, the C2 sampling phase noise is shown here. It's, uh, it's an additional uh, noise that we introduce uh, because of the additional C2 sampling. But this is still way smaller uh, than uh, the conventional kind of SAR ADCs uh, and allow us to use very small input uh, capacitors. So overall, you can actually uh, achieve a, over 50 times reduction in the KD over C1 noise. You can use smaller capacitors and still the total noise has been reduced by 2.6 times. So this represents the benefit of the proposed architecture. Okay. Uh, so there are also other uh, circuit non-ideality. So one of them is the input capacitance of the preamp. This is actually a nonlinear cap, uh, but this nonlinear cap is not uh, is not a a, a big problem. It, it has some problems. One of the problems is that uh, this uh, input capacitance uh, of the preamp at uh, it's basically about 20 femtofarad will introduce a 1.3 dB kind of noise increase because of the capacitance division ratio. But this is common uh, in in the uh, this is also present in the classic uh, uh, SAR ADC as well. So there's this is like something that we just, uh, it's fine. It, it, it's, it's also present in the classic design. Another thing is that uh, this capacitance is actually a nonlinear capacitance. So if there's a signal swing here, it may cause some uh, nonlinearity. Uh, but fortunately, uh, the signal swing at this node is actually very small. It's only like 80 millivolt or so. Uh, so this uh, nonlinear capacitance uh, you don't, it doesn't really introduce a large uh, nonlinear, it can be ignored. Another issue is the preamp delay, right? As we mentioned earlier, the amplifier has finite bandwidth, which translates to a, a, a non-zero delay. Uh, so the real sampling moment is actually not at T2, but rather at T2 minus TD. There's a delay uh, of this preamplifier, uh, but it's not really a problem uh, as long as this TD is a constant. So is it really a constant? Well, uh, let's take a look at the uh, amplifier kind of phase response. So we can see that uh, in this signal band, uh, the Nyquist rate is 20 megahertz in this design. The amplifier actually has a very wide bandwidth, like a 525 megahertz. So you can see that within the signal band, it just, you can think about that the delay is constant, okay? And therefore, it doesn't really cause any nonlinearity. The constant delay is just like constant a group delay, right? Constant phase shift. Okay, another non-ideality is the uh, preamp uh, gain mismatch, right? It, during the sampling phase, it is seeing a continuous time input, and during conversion phase, it is equivalently seeing a DC input. And this uh, may actually have different gains. And if it has different gains, 
uh, you write down the equation, you'll see that uh, the noise won't be completely canceled. But again, fortunately, that uh, within the signal band, uh, the amplitude response is rather flat. Uh, and then this means that the two gang actually meet each other. And if the gang meet each other, uh, then uh, this non-ideality is actually can, can, can get canceled out. And the end result is very clean. It's just like the delayed input plus the uh, KD over C2 noise divided by A. So this basically, there are non-idealities, but if we just uh, deal with them, model them correctly, and then design the circuit pro uh, properly, then these issues can be addressed. Okay, so now let me show you uh, the, the circuit block diagram. Uh, so this is our circuit. You can see it's very simple. It's like a classic uh, SAR ADC. The only difference that we add is additional capacitors at the preamp output. Uh, there's two extra capacitors and the switch. And this is the extra load we add to the preamp to limit its noise. Overall, it's a 13 bit converter. They're running at 40 megasm per second. Uh, and then with uh, this uh, non-overlapping time, uh, no, 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 but the time that uh, between the falling edge of phi one and the falling edge of phi two, it's basically 0.6 nanosecond. Uh, this uh, capacitor size, they're very small. All of them are in the range of 100 femtofarad or, or, or lower. Uh, the preamp is a classic uh, CMOS uh, input stage uh, that gain of six. Uh, and we use this uh, CMOS input to basically increase the uh, the current reuse factor, right? It uh, doubles the GM for the same bias current, and that's saving power. Uh, and then the common mode feedback is also very simple. It's just a resistor divider based common mode feedback. Uh, this is the CDAC design. We use a bridge capacitor uh, because the, uh, the DAC is very small. It's only like, uh, like 100 uh, femtofarad or so. So we use this bridge DAC to make sure that the unit capacitor is not too small. So here, the unique capacitor side is 0.85 femtofarad, and we use foreground calibration to uh, deal with its mismatch. This is the uh, diphoto of this SAR ADC. It's, uh, it's uh, only 0.005 millimeter square. So it turns out that this is the, uh, the smallest Nyquist radius ADC with ENOP greater than 11 bit. Okay, this is the smallest uh, like conver uh, Nyquist converter uh, with a uh, ENOP greater than 11 bit. So this is very small area. The reason it's very small is because we can significantly reduce the capacitor size. Uh, it's only 100 femtos uh, or so, right? If otherwise, uh, we would need like picofarad a capacitor and that will just easily blow up the area. Uh, this is the measured uh, spectrum at low frequencies. Uh, the SNDR is about uh, 71 dB, the SFDR 86 dB. And near Nyquist, uh, the SNDR is 69 dB, SFDR is 79 dB. Uh, demonstrating a proper uh, operation. Uh, this is the uh, frequency sweep. Again, you can see SNDR almost flat and, and SFDR is like uh, in the range of 80 dB. Uh, this is the, uh, the dynamic range sweep. It's 72 dB of dynamic range. So all, 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 all proper operation. This is the measured power breakdown. Uh, you can see that the majority of power is spent on the preamp. Uh, this is because we want to over-design the preamp with wide bandwidth but this actually have opportunity to reduce the preamp power as well by further optimizing the circuit. So there's still a lot of uh, space for further improvement from a power efficiency perspective. This is the overall summary of our work uh, comparing to the, our prior work as well as other works. So you can see that our work is able to reduce uh, the KD over C1 noise, uh, C noise, uh, like uh, these are the two works. Uh, so uh, we allow us to use a very small input capacitors in the range of 100 or 200 uh, femtofarad range. Uh, this is a work published in NIDSC in 2015. So this work can also have very small input capacitance by putting an input buffer uh, embedded inside a SAR ADC. Uh, but uh, because it's not able to reduce the KD over C noise, so inside it still have a large sampling capacitor the size of seven picofarad. In these two works, they're able to suppress KD over C noise and therefore they don't have uh, big capacitors anywhere in their circuit. Uh, it's very, it's all, always very small. For this, uh, the, the new work uh, published this year in ISSCC is able to apply for a DC signal uh, and also can significantly expand the sampling rate by almost 20 times and have a very small area, the lowest area ever uh, uh, for uh, high resolution Nyquist rate converters, and then maintain still a very good uh, figure of merit, both the Schreier figure of merit and the Warren figure of merit. And I want to emphasize again that uh, by using our circuit, it's able to reduce input capacitance, and therefore there's going to be even more power savings on the system level when you include the power, not only, uh, not only the ADC core, but also the ADC driver and the reference bottom. Okay, so let me draw the conclusion. Uh, so I, I hopefully I, I, I convince you that 
the KD over C noise is not fundamental uh, in the data converter, in the Nyquist rate ADC. You can, you can address this thing by uh, using a seven hold less continuous time operation, or you can apply cancellation uh, for the uh, KD over C noise. And there's yet another method. Uh, it's uh, by decoupling the noise bandwidth and, and the power spectral density. And this is what we published at BRSI 2020. Uh, but due to time limitation, I won't be able to explain that to you. But uh, you're welcome to uh, look at our papers published uh, there. So I just uh, want to kind of share with you uh, two of my uh, uh, favorite phrases. Uh, so, so before we started our work, uh, 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 we always hear people say that uh, you have to make have to use large capacitors uh, if you have segment whole circuit, uh, like in a Nyquist rate converter. Uh, but we uh, we kind of uh, didn't really uh, buy it, so we tried something different. Uh, so I think it's very important that as a designer, in order to be innovative, we want to think different, right? We want to think the unthinkable. We don't want to take uh, like the conventional wisdom as 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 the as something that unbreakable, right? If we just take it. Uh, and, and, and believe in it, and I, we, won't have, uh, we won't have solutions, right? So we first uh, be able to question it and think different, uh, think the unthinkable, and then we can actually have uh, solutions uh, to a seemingly fundamental problem. And then I'd like to acknowledge uh, my students, uh, so especially Lin Xiaoshen and, and Jia Xin Liu. So these are the heroes uh, behind these two works. Uh, they allow me to kind of like present uh, to you and as a, an advisor, I'm very proud for my students. So, so far we have graduated 21 PhDs from our group. Uh, and then uh, some of them have won very good awards and some of them become faculty members and the rest at companies. Our group is a very active group. And since 2017, uh, we have actually published 24 uh, JSSE papers. Uh, so one of the most productive group uh, in the IC design field in the world. And we still have like uh, even more uh, papers under review. And we also have 29 papers in uh, all of this kind of like conferences with, uh, uh, with chip uh, measurement results. Uh, so about 29 papers at ISSC, BISI and CICC. So with this, I'd like to end my talk and thank you very much for your attention and you're welcome to ask any questions. Okay, thanks a lot Nan for the very nice presentation. Um, we have several questions from the audience in Q&A. So let me uh, read them, them for you. So the first question is about uh, the KT over C noise. So what about the KT over noise due to the DSC switches? Due to the switches. Um, uh, let me let me see. So, I mean, the KD over C noise are produced by switches, right? Uh, by the resistance of the switches. So it's captured there already. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what you're exactly uh, what what exactly uh, asking. It, it, this the noise from the switch is already captured in the KD over C one noise uh, shown here. Um, so, so it I is think being the question considered is about the. DAC. So, are you? Is this capturing oh, okay. the noise also in the DAC switches? Oh, I see. So basically, in the DAC operation, in the in the SAR conversion phase, right? The DAC also have like uh, this. This have switches. Uh, uh, this switch will have also have like resistance, and that will also also produce noise, right? But your this DAC noise is not a big deal in a in a SAR converter because this resistance is actually uh, usually very small. Uh, and then in the DAC, this RC time constant really small. So the DAC bandwidth is really very wide. Uh, and then this noise will be filtered out by the preamplifier and then by the latch. So it's true that the, DAC, the DAC's resistance can contribute noise, but that uh, it's usually not a, a major contributor of noise in the overall uh, ADC. And this is true not only for our circuit, but also for conventional star leaf design as well. Okay, Th thank you, Nan, for the answer. Um, so and I would especially expect you... if you use a smaller capacitor uh, side, and it will further attenuate the noise from the switches. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, uh, so I was expecting questions on negative delay, the concept you introduced early on in the talk, and mm -hmm. there is a question on that. So the question is that this should be non-causal. So how is it possible to create it? Uh, do we have some assumptions on the input signal for? creating the negative delay? Oh yeah, that's a very nice question. So uh, yeah, this is, if you just look at this non, uh, like this negative delay, it is indeed non-causal. I, I think I need to be more uh, accurate in the sense that I'm not, uh, I'm not creating a block that give you, like give you a negative delay across all signal bandwidth. 
uh, the signal has to be band limited. And this, you can only produce a negative delay within the signal band or basically within a finite bandwidth. And this is doable. And we cannot create like a, a block that give you negative delay across the whole bandwidth. That's non-causal. But you can actually produce, you can design a filter with a negative group delay uh, 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 within a finite bandwidth. And that's, that's fine. Like, like an implementation, something like this. And if you're interested, you can take a look at this paper. It will show you how to build such a uh, prediction kind of filter. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a specific question on slides 40 to 42. So you may have to go to those slides. And the question is, um, so if you open up slide 40, for example, um, yeah, so uh, how much does the input cap of A hurt the cancellation? Uh, the input cap of A, right, yes. uh, hurt the cancellation. So um, let me see. So the input cap hurt the, so the input cap, as we mentioned uh, later, uh, this input cap uh, has a uh, attenuation. Let me see. So I have this, uh, no, this, this cap, right? This, this nonlinear, uh, this, this cap. This cap will cause essentially a uh, attenuation uh, here. Um, but this attenuation just brought like a like a DB kind of noise penalty. It's not like a major uh, issue. I think you're. I think maybe you're. Maybe the question is like, uh, how does this find uh, like this this capacitor hurt the overall KDRC cancellation, right? That's correct. That's a I very good question. question. Yeah. Um, so does, it, does it cause any trouble in the cancellation? Actually, I haven't thought about it. Uh, let me let me just think about it. Um, so this being stored here and then being amplified and stored across C2. And during the, I think it won't affect the overall cancellation because this capacitance is always there. You can just model it as kind of like this gain get reduced by a little bit, right? So let's say the gain is six by having this uh, input capacitance, the gain, the real gain is actually five point, let's say seven. But this cancellation does, doesn't depend on an accurate gain. So even though this gain get reduced by let's say 10%, the cancellation is still there. Uh, it won't be affected by uh, by this uh, by this capacitance. So I think may maybe the question was also pointing to if you have variations and process variations, and this uh, estimate is uh, not equal to what it actually is, uh, would it affect your eventual cancellation? But oh, that's also it doesn't matter, right? You said it doesn't matter so much. Yeah, it doesn't matter because uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. So it so, so this a as long as it's constant uh, during the tracking and during the conversion phase, then it's okay. It doesn't have to be exactly six exactly seven uh it it doesn't matter um it, it it the cancellation is still there just like in the classic output series offset cancellation scheme uh, you don't rely on this uh gain to be accurate okay thank you um we have time for a couple of more questions so let me read a question here and there are now several so we may not be able to go through all of them but let, let me read this one the ct adc presented in part one is an ac coupled adc so it has a high pass response. Uh, what type of resistor or pseudo resistor is required to convert signals in the kilohertz range? Uh, does this pseudo resistor contribute noise? Okay, that's a very good question. I didn't show it, but indeed that here is a pseudo resistor uh, because it's AC coupled, which has to provide a DC bias. This is provided by a pseudo resistor. So in our, I think in our design, I think we're targeting, I, I didn't remember the exact kind of bandwidth, but we're targeting something like, like 100 of hertz up to about one megahertz. Uh, so it depends on your target bandwidth. Uh, so if you target really low bandwidth, I think pseudo resistor has to be very big. Um, uh, I think just uh, like a typical design, um, in, in, in just you, you choose the pseudo resistor size uh, to make sure that uh, the lower uh, cutoff frequency is low enough. I guess, it, am I answering the question or? Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, maybe the uh, the audience member wanted a more specific answer, like what kind of kilohertz range is practical before the size becomes too big? Uh, oh, okay. Um, I um, Yeah, if you're targeting like really low frequencies, right? Then uh, this, uh, this, re this pseudo resistor side will be pretty big, right? Uh, I don't have a specific number, but I think you have to increase, uh, make sure that the pseudo resistor is very big, uh, so that uh, the low frequency signal can still pass through. But you really want to kind of, kind of like, uh, like solve this like uh, low frequency signal, right? You can use other techniques, for example, chopping, 
uh, and, and other ways to deal with this really low frequency input. Basically turn this thing, uh, the circuit to, to be able to work for DC, right? There are ways to do that. Yeah. For our kind of like uh, design, we are targeting, I think, I, I don't recall the exact number, we're targeting like in the range of hundreds of hertz and that's enough what we designed, uh, like uh, just a standard like pseudo resistor. Okay, thank you. Um, can you go to slide 55? There is a very specific question for that slide. Um, and the question is, uh, there are two figures on the slide and uh, are the two figures identical? The two figures? No, they're not identical. The classic design, uh, they don't have the C2 and Phi2 switch for the proposed SAR, they have a C2 switch and then the uh, C2 capacitor and the Phi2 switch. Yes, okay, yeah, I, th I think it's clear from the figure now, <laughs> thank you. Uh, um, and one final question uh, for today. Um, in the end of the talk, if you may have to go to the, towards the end of your presentation, uh, there's a comparison with implementations by other teams. Um, there is one implementation, um, the ISSCC 2015, um, uh, whose power and area is comparable to current one, but without KT by noise cancellation. Um, let's see if we can identify that paper or that work. Um, uh, this one? Yeah, let me see. I, I'm trying to read the question and trying to also look, look at your slide. So uh -huh. ISSC 2015, uh, there is a this method one. that uh, whose power and area are comparable to your solution, um, but there is no KTO by C noise cancellation. Um, and the question I is, think do you have more information? Pointing yeah, I think this is the one, the pipe SAR. Yeah, I think it's this one, right? So if you look at area, right? The area is actually, it's, there is a big difference, right? You compare it to this, this is five time reduction, compared to this like 10 times reduction, right? From an area perspective, because this capacity like four pico, this is like, I mean, point something pico, right? So this is like a significant difference in area. From a power efficiency perspective, I, I, I agree that from a core ADC pers power perspective, it, they're comparable, uh, but, uh, well, you have to drive this large capacitor, right? In a, from a system perspective, when you include the power of the uh, ADC driver as well as the reference buffer, the system power consumption will be much bigger. Uh, I mean, I think it will be much bigger than what we we have here because this very small capacitor, so they're very easy to drive, uh, and the input driver and reference buffers power can be much smaller. So I think what 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 is more important is on the system level how much power you consume, not just the ADC core. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that makes sense. All right. So I think we should uh, conclude the webinar here. We are out of time. So thank you, uh, Professor Nansun. That was a very uh, engaging talk and we had good interactions. Uh, thank you to, uh, to, the, uh, to the audience, the participants. Um, and with that, I uh, end this uh, webinar here. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye to everybody. Yeah, thank you very much for your moderation. Very nice moderator. Thank you very much uh, for my introduction and, and, and organizing my talk. I appreciate You're most it. welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye.